And welcome to our third Power to the People webinar. Tonight's webinar is The Power of Movements, The Struggle to Pass the 19th Amendment and Beyond. My name is Mark Gage. I'm the Director of Publishing for the Center for Civic Education, and I'll be serving as the facilitator of this event. Our sponsors for Power to the People are the Center for Civic Education, Kansas State University, the Johnson County First Amendment Foundation, and the Indiana Bar Foundation. Thank you so much, sponsors. Without you, this event would not be possible. Our moderators for tonight are Robert S. Lemming, Director of the We the People programs for the Center for Civic Education, and Thomas Vance, Director of the Center for Social Studies Education at Kansas State University. And our scholar for tonight is Lisa Tetro, Associate Professor at Carnegie Mellon University. Lisa specializes in the history of US women and gender. Historian of the 19th century, she focuses on social movements, particularly feminism, American democracy, and the politics of memory. Her first book, The Myth of Seneca Falls, Memory and the Women's Suffrage Movement, 1848 to 1898, won the Organization of American Historians inaugural Mary Jurek Nicholas Women's History Book Prize. Tetro is currently at work on two book-length projects. The first, a celebrated but misunderstood amendment, is a genealogy of the 19th Amendment, which supposedly gave women the right to vote. The second, Interwoman Suffrage, a New History of Reconstruction, 1865 to 1878, investigates the broad and frequent debates about women's voting, most of which are unrecognized during the Reconstruction era. Techo also lectures on the U.S. suffrage movement, broadly construed, and is active as a public historian. Welcome to everyone, and I hope you enjoy tonight's presentation. And with that, I'll turn it over to Robert S. Lemming. Bob. Thank you, Mark. Welcome, everybody. Uh, you can tell I'm excited about uh, this, uh, this tonight's uh, presentation. So I'll, with that, I'll just say thanks for showing up. And I hope we have uh, a lively discussion. Uh, uh, Tom and I will be monitoring the chat to see what's going on. And uh, Lisa has agreed to take questions. Uh, but we do have ample time at the end. So if you can hold off, that's good, too. So uh, with that, uh, Tom, you want to say anything or should we just get to Lisa? Just welcome everybody. And I'm really looking forward to it, Lisa. And uh, yeah, I love uh, talking about mm -hmm. social movements and uh, the how things have changed uh, throughout our history. So uh, I'm looking forward to it. Thank you so much. All right. Well, welcome, everyone. Um, uh, I am delighted to be with you. It has been uh, disappointing not to be in person with people, but also delightful to be able to reach so many different and varied audiences now that we've all moved to Zoom. Um, I hope that this conversation can help you with your teaching, as I understand many of you are teachers. Uh, and many of you are high school teachers. Uh, and to me, those are the most important historians in this country. You do all of the frontline history education in a way that is the most impactful and the most broad ranging and the most broad reaching. And so part of what I hope our conversation tonight does is give you a way to think about teaching democracy, teaching social movements and teaching voting rights more generally, not just the story of women's suffrage, but more generally, the question of how the 19th Amendment fits into um, the landscape of a voting rights social movement that has been broad ranging and massive over the course of American history. Uh, I'll do this a little, I'll, I'm gonna frame 1920 a bit differently today uh, as we'll get through. And I hope that it gives you some ideas for how you might teach differently and also that we think about how uh, the expansion and the creation really of American democracy has been the, the, um, the uh, product of social movements. Um, the founders never envisioned that we would be a democracy. That's something that social movements have created in the United States. And it's something that social movements will have to fight to keep alive. So um, with that, let's get into it. Uh, and um, if you have uh, particular questions as this moves on, then feel free to um, 
uh, shoot them in like like Bob said, we'll save questions for the end. I'll talk for about 45 minutes or so, and then we'll have about uh, 45 minutes for discussion. Okay, but if you have pressing questions that must be answered, feel free to throw them into the chat or just keep a little log to yourself off on, on the side. So we are convened around the 19th Amendment, which is celebrating its uh, centennial this year in 2020. The 19th Amendment is pretty well recognized. It is the amendment that um, gave women suffrage, that guaranteed women the right to vote, that um, you know gave all women voting rights in the United States. Um, and this is pretty well rehearsed uh, territory. Uh, and 1920 is enshrined as the date when this happened. As you can see on this map here with dates from around the world, you can see the United States was neither the first nor the last, um, uh, but that is the way 1920 is narrated. And we see that here in some pieces from 1920, right after the amendment was ratified in Tennessee, giving women of the entire nation vote this fall, or if we Google the 19th Amendment, we will find endless versions that explain things like this um, today. It uh, granted women the right to vote or it guarantees all women the right to vote. Um, and that's what we're gonna talk about today is this idea of the right to vote and the relationship of social movements to it because it is a pretty poorly misunderstood concept, which is surprising given that we all value the, our right to vote so fundamentally but it is something that we, um, we misunderstand in all kinds of ways, partly because of the way we narrate this history. And one of the things that particularly interests me as a historian is thinking through how we narrate history and how the way we tell the story of history shapes very fundamentally the kinds of moral lessons and the kinds of present day um, uh, lessons that we draw from this past. So, um, I'm going to shift away from this date of 1920 and not sort of tell, you know, the triumphal narrative of 1920 um, when women got the right to vote, which I'm going to argue today women did not get in 1920. No woman got it, not just only white women. Um, and I'm going to focus instead on this asterisk. It's here. Um, right after 1920. And if you look down, this is something that I got off the web. If you look down kind of underneath here, it will tell you uh, some women voted before and not all women voted after. Um, so, but that I think is actually where the crux of the story lies. And I think if we shift our attention there, we come up with a very different story. Um, and the story that I'm gonna tell today is one of 1920, neither as the beginning of women voting, nor as the end of our story but really as the middle of a much longer ongoing story that is completely unfinished and um, handed to you and I in the present right now. So we're gonna start our narration, not in some of the places you might imagine with Seneca Falls or Stanton or Anthony or anybody else like that. We're gonna start right here with the constitution itself. Because one of the things we forget to do is um, ask ourselves, what does the constitution say about voting and how did the 19th amendment uh, disrupt that. Uh, and this has been the most surprising thing as I've been speaking to audiences around the country this uh, centennial season. There is no right to vote. Um, that is correct. You just heard me, uh, you heard me accurately. The Constitution contains absolutely no expression of a citizen's right to vote. It contains no expression of anyone's right to vote. Uh, I encourage you to get out your Constitution and take a look. Um, if I had asked you just before I said that, where do you think your right to vote resides? Chances are you would have answered in the constitution. And so of course, that's why women went to the constitution so that they could too get that right to vote. That is not what the 19th amendment does, nor is that what's happening here. Um, the 19th amendment does not let women into some pre-existing right in the constitution. Uh, the founding fathers who, I, as I said, did not intend to create a democracy, completely bypassed the question of who should vote. They just didn't address it. So they didn't create a voting right because they didn't think people had a voting right. Um, and they didn't specify who voters were. That was left to the states. And that continues, excuse me, that continues to be true today. Uh, that has not changed despite over two centuries of activism on this very point about expanding voting rights. Um, you will be surprised to know that not only did the original constitution not include your right to vote, um, our present day constitution and our present day laws still do not contain a right to vote. Um, we as American citizens have no right to vote. Um, although most people will say that it's their most sacred and fundamental right. Um, so 
back to the states. The states at the founding had to decide who voted. So each of the states decided the question differently. Some states drew up lists of qualifications that required that voters be male. And some states, New Jersey specifically, drew up lists of qualifications in which they did not specify that voters be male. Um, and so in New Jersey, for example, for quite some time, women who met the other qualifications for voters, which were using property, residency, things like that, were able to vote. Um, not all states required that voters be white. Um, and in some states, if African-American men or in New Jersey, an African-American woman met the property requirement and the residency requirement, they too could vote. Um, and so again, and this is still true today, whether you can vote depends on what state you live in. Because as long as you clear the state obstacles to voting, and we can call these two things here, right? Obstacles or voter qualification clauses, right? Because essentially a list of voter qualifications is a list of disenfranchisement practices, or it's a list of things that you should be in order to vote. We can think of it both ways. Um, that is still true today, that when you vote, it's because you clear all the voter qualification methods in your state and therefore you can access the vote, but you are not invested with a right to vote. A state can abridge that on pretty much any ground still today. Um, and so at the founding, for a variety of reasons, um, the states are going to start changing their voting qualifications. And by the 1820s and 30s, all states now require that voters be among a whole list of other things, white and male. And what we're going to talk about today are those two words in state constitutions or in state voter descriptions of who can vote. So again, there is no right to vote. The states can therefore drop lists of who, you know, and disqualify people on whatever grounds they want because there is no right to vote that they're abridging. So the states are free to disqualify people on any and all grounds. Um, all right. Uh, and by the 1820s and 30s, these are two of the grounds that all states use, uh, both the original 13 states and then all the states that have since joined the union. So enter social movements. Um, at the very founding, you hear John Adams and other people saying, there are a bunch of people clamoring for access to this thing called voting. There are people clamoring for the ability to govern themselves. We need to clamp down on this. We can't have this. So we don't actually know kind of when women first started stirring for voting access, but it's clear that there were lots of people, women of um, all races, clamoring for some kind of governance over themselves at the moment of the founding of the nation. Um, but the story conventionally um, starts here with this women's rights movement that grows out of anti-slavery in the 1830s and the 1840s uh, in the United States, the antebellum era. And this was a biracial co-ed movement that was highly unpopular in the North that demanded the immediate abolition of slavery and evolved women as active participants. Um, and when those women as active participants went out into the public and spoke forcefully, they were attacked as unsexing themselves, as being out of their sphere and the idea was in the 19th century, women belonged in the domestic sphere where they were to be passive and submissive. Men belonged in the public sphere where they were to be forceful and, um, and uh, determinant of the way in the which the world should operate. So as women moved into the public, they were said to be um, unwomanly and um, breaking with God's intention. And when they were speaking forcefully and they were breaking with you know, the polling dictate that they be silent. So those women started to defend themselves um, and defend their right to speak their political minds. And as they did that, they started to articulate women's rights stances. By the 1850s, there is something discernible in the United States called a women's rights movement. It is not the only agitation around women's rights, but is the one that's sort of visible publicly. Um, and that again was a biracial movement and they would not have called themselves a suffrage movement. They called themselves a women's rights movement. They had a broad slate of demands. Um, and again, this is still tightly tied to the abolitionist movement and the fight to end slavery and a civil rights activism. But these women also say women need equal pay. They need an end to the sexual double standard. They need access to the professions. They need equal education. They need property rights and they need the vote. Um, so that was just one demand among many, and it wasn't the preeminent demand the way we often remember it now. 
then um, this group of women, however, would never have asked for a constitutional amendment, the 19th Amendment. So that's not how the suffrage movement begins. Because this group understood there was nothing in the Constitution that regulated voting. So if you wanted to access a voting privilege or what we now call a voting right, um, you wouldn't go to the Constitution, you would go to the states. And so that's what they did. They went to the states and tried to get that word male eliminated so that they could clear voting. And of course, for women of color, that would not have been sufficient. They would have to get white eliminated as well. And many black men and black women and Latino men and Latino women were also fighting to get the word white removed. But this was again, a state-based fight. Um, and that removal of a word was called a voting right. But we'll get to that in just a minute. Um, the constitutional amendment um, is something that comes out of the American Civil War. That's where the idea of using the constitution for voting rights, as we call them, comes from. Um, and it comes from specifically the results of the war, that we are still one nation. And secondly, that chattel slavery is officially, at least, uh, as an institution ended. With that comes a whole new fight in America. Uh, what is the status of freed people? There are you know, 4 million plus free African-Americans now in the United States. Are they citizens? Dred Scott had said they weren't. Are they subject to the same code of laws as white people? Are they voters? You know, what is their status? An entire fight breaks out known as reconstruction, the rebuilding of a nation. And among the demands that freed people make on freedom is voting and voting rights. Congress decides to grant that in the last of the constitutional amendments, um, the 15th, or the last of the reconstruction amendments, excuse me, the 15th amendment. And um, the 15th amendment, amazingly, so now we're like 100 years roughly after the signing of the American Constitution, right? This is, you know, 1869, 1867. Um, and uh, this is the first time in US history that Congress has had a full scale robust debate on the voting rights of its citizens, which is astonishing when you think about it, that 100 years into our history, our main governing sort of people's body actually takes up our voting rights for the very first time. And there is a wild, crazy debate about what should this constitutional amendment say. Uh, it is considered quite heretical by many states' rights people that the Constitution is being used at all to govern, you know, to govern the question of voting because this is not thought to be within federal power. Um, and one of the things they propose is what many of us think exists but does not yet exist. They say, you know, we should add a constitutional amendment that says all citizens have the right to vote and Congress should actually govern voting rights, not the states. That never gets traction. Um, but that would have been even more radical because it would have enfranchised everybody and it would have struck down all state disqualifications because all would have abridged a fundamental right to vote that I'm invested with that the states can't deny me. That does not get traction, partly because the North and the West really like disenfranchising. Um, and they really like being able to pick voters and not having voters pick them. So almost all freed people were in the South and the North and the West doesn't wanna give up their ability to disenfranchise and control voting in their territory. So they write up a different constitutional amendment um, and the one they write up does not actually confer a right to vote. Even though we often think of the 15th amendment as granting black men the right to vote using exactly the same language that we use for the 19th granting women the right to vote. In fact, the 15th amendment says this, there should be no discrimination in voting on account of race, color or previous condition of servitude. So this actually does not speak to African-American men at all. It kind of circumvents them. It does not invest African-American men with a right to vote. What it says is you states, you may no longer use the word white in your voter qualifications and thereby indirectly or negatively enfranchises black men by negatively striking down a word at the state level and thereby African-American men enter into voting as a result, more as a kind of um, collateral effect than as the intent, you know, the um, being invested with that right. So the, the 15th Amendment does not invest black men with the right to vote, nor does it actually say anything about men. Um, but the reason that black women are not enfranchised by this is because the word male still exists everywhere. Um, so this is de facto a black men's, uh, uh, you know, uh, voting uh, amendment. This mostly creates robust biracial democracies in the South where most African-Americans still live. 
Uh, and what happens after this is a massive expansion in black male voting against incredible vigilante violence um, and intimidation and repression. And some of the first biracial democracies are created in the United States as a result of this. Um, for about 10 years, there are these, you know, African American men vote, they send African American men to Congress, Mississippi of all places will send the first black man to Congress, Hiram Revels. Um, and uh, other me black men go to uh, Congress and represent uh, in, uh, in the US House. And um, state legislatures have large numbers of African American men in them, uh, you get judges elected justices of the peace who are African American. And those um, governments do incredibly important work. They start to create a schooling system. They do all kinds of things. They are always under great threat and violence um, from white uh, supremacists who want to suppress that, um, that new biracial experiment. And we'll come back to that story in a minute. But you cannot separate the history of the 19th Amendment from the history of the 15th Amendment. We often tell these on two separate parallel tracks, one about gender and one about race. They are in fact completely intertwined. You cannot understand one without the other. Um, and this amendment is precisely where these two ladies, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony, the era's two most famous suffragists, get the idea for a federal amendment. This amendment clears Congress and goes to the states for ratification. And that abolitionist feminist coalition from the Annabella era in the United States regroups after the war. And they think, okay, emancipation has been achieved. What do we do now? Uh, and they decide that they're going to press for two innovations, African-American uh, men's voting and women's voting. Um, and by that, they meant black and white. So when the 15th Amendment clears Congress, this is a pretty happy, happy moment, right? It's half of what they're demanding, except they convene to kind of figure out how to support the 15th Amendment through the ratification process. But these two, Stanton and Anthony, show up and say, no, absolutely not. If it is a matter of priority, they say, then educated white womanhood should go first. Their allies are shocked. Stanton, um, who uh, began her activism in the antebellum period, as did Susan B. Anthony, uh, gets into an incredibly ugly fight with Frederick Douglass, the nation's leading African-American statesman at this point, uh, himself once an escaped slave. Uh, and um, Stanton says, no, I refuse to support this amendment. And um, you know, if it's a matter of priority, let educated white womanhood go first. She shall not be ground down under the heels of ignorant Sambos. She then goes on to insult um, uh, Irish and Chinese immigrants. And she suggests that white women are actually in danger if black men begin voting before them. Frederick Douglass is appalled. And Frederick Douglass says in response, we are being hunted down through the South. Our brains are being dashed out on the pavements and we are being hung from lampposts. We must have the vote now. It is a matter of life and death. And Stanton refuses to repent. The two of them, Stanton and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, uh, Stanton and Susan B. Anthony, to me, they're just like conflated at this point. Um, they go off and they break with this feminist abolitionist coalition and form the first National Woman Suffrage Association in the United States. And this is really the beginning of a kind of nationally recognized suffrage movement in the United States. Uh, and they oppose the 15th Amendment, um, which is, you know, um, pretty ugly. Uh, and they also say, however, the one redeeming feature of the 15th Amendment is that it has federalized suffrage. Suffrage now is something within the province of Congress. We can skirt this whole state campaign and just go to Congress, sort of, you know, batten, you know, uh, sort of attack that citadel and get our voting rights through the Constitution. So they propose a new amendment, the 16th Amendment, which we'll come back to in a minute. And that 16th Amendment that they propose will eventually become the 19th Amendment. Meanwhile, many of their allies are completely appalled by Stanton and Anthony's behavior, and Lucy Stone is chief among them. She's an equally famous suffragist of the era. She had begun lecturing on women's rights and abolition in 1847, um, one of the first women to get a college degree, uh, and she is a you know absolutely renowned um, activist in her era, um, forgotten for all kinds of reasons, but um, certainly not um, in the time that she lived. She says, this is an abomination, we must support the 15th Amendment. And she breaks then and forms the American Woman Suffrage Association. So the movement is born divided because social activism is a messy, ugly, complicated endeavor. Um, it is never the kind of harmonious, happy, uh, kind of kumbaya uh, extravaganza that we often remember it as. It is messy, it is complicated, it is fraught with infighting, um, it's exhausting, uh, it's demoralizing. 
Um, and Lucy Stone says, not only do we support the 15th Amendment, but she says one other thing. We don't support the federal amendment for women's suffrage. We do not support a 16th Amendment. We think that is unlawful. The 15th Amendment was a war measure done for the safety of freed people. It does not change constitutional governance around voting. And if women want the vote, they must go back to the states and get the word male struck state by state by state. And that's what the American Suffrage Association's work is. Meanwhile, there's African-American women present in this assembly. Um, and one of them is Frances Ellen Watkins Harper. Um, and she is a, a teacher, a, a poet, an essayist, a civil rights speaker, a women's rights speaker. Uh, and she comes and she says, to, you know, to the Feminist Abolitionist Coalition, the kinds of things that we would expect Black feminists to say today, this is an intersectional fight and we cannot divide it. And she says, you know, I am suspicious that the vote is everything these white women make it out to be. It, I need much more than the vote. And um, we cannot divide this question. We must not divide ourselves. She, we are all bound up together, she says, in one great bundle of humanity. These African-American women in this moment will lose this, uh, lose this fight. And Black suffrage will be construed as male, and women's suffrage will be construed as white, and Black women will be forgotten in this public debate. They will not disappear, however. Um, they will often not organize with white women because they do not find a comfortable home organizing with white women. Those white women have very narrow concerns as far as they're concerned. They're also very myopic on questions of race, uh, and they're not speaking often to a broader civil rights agenda that um, these women also uh, want to pursue and um, demand. So one of the things we have to do in this um, centennial moment is recover the history of those Black women because we can't just recover the history of Black women by going and finding them in white suffrage organizing because that's not where they were. They would occasionally dip in and out of that organizing in order to leverage you know, alliances with white women to get something that they needed, to let white women know that they weren't gonna control the discourse. But for the most part, these women began organizing on their own with other Black women and also and sometimes in league with Black men. Um, they will found things like the Black Women's Club. They will found things like the National Association of Colored Women. Um, and so that history is one that we're just recovering, sort of finding Black women where they are and finding out what their rights agendas were, which always involved suffrage but didn't center on suffrage. Um, and there's a new book out by Martha Jones called Vanguard, How women, Black Women Broke Barriers, Won the Vote, and um, Fought for Equality for All, which tries to do exactly that, tell a different through line, not this 1848 to 1920 story, but a story that focuses on sort of Black women's lives. Okay, so back to the 16th Amendment. Um, the 16th Amendment, this is the language of it. Um, and you'll notice something. Does it look familiar? Um, is someone speaking? Sorry, uh, no, that was just a mistake. You oh, okay, go, go no problem. I just wanted to like give everyone a chance to weigh in. <laughs> um, okay, so the 16th Amendment, you'll notice, is modeled exactly on the 15th Amendment. It's the exact same language. And this 16th Amendment that is articulated in the 1860s and the 1870s is exactly the amendment that will pass 50 years later in 1919 and then 1920. The right of citizens to vote shall not be denied or abridged on account of sex, okay, in Congress. Here you see the right to citizens to vote. They, like us, refer constantly to their right to vote, but that is a mirage, really. It does not exist in law anywhere. But this would only do what the 15th Amendment did. It would be a negative conferral of a right to vote. It, because it would strike down the word male, but it wouldn't positively and affirmatively confer a right to vote upon women, which is super important. And so what the 16th Amendment or what becomes the 19th Amendment, much like the 15th Amendment, does not confer a right to vote upon anybody. It just says to the states, cut that practice out. This goes nowhere, as I said, for 50 years. But the state story starts to unfold some pretty significant victories um, because, as we remember, it is local people on the ground that make movements. And part of the problem of historical remembering is that it's famous people and leaders that get their papers preserved. And so the stories of social activism often turns around um, those leaders whose papers get preserved. But in fact, this was a story of millions of people on the ground fighting for this. Um, and those millions of people start to get their individual states to start dropping the word male. 
And this happens first in the West um, for reasons that we don't fully understand as historians. And here what you see is a lithograph from 19, uh, the 19 teens. This is sort of Liberty here. She's got a cape on called Votes for Women. And these are all the states that have enfranchised women and she's marching across the United States bringing this to the clamoring masses out East. Um, the first state to enfranchise women, actually it was a territory, was Wyoming in 1869, Utah in 1870. And then by the 1890s, a few more states out west do it. And then by the 1900s and the 1910s, a bunch of states strike the word male under pressure from on the ground activists. Thousands, you know, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of women and men who keep this pressure up on the ground. Leaders jump around. It's people on the ground who fight for these things and keep the pressure alive. People whose names we often don't know and can't recover. This is what women's suffrage looked like then on the eve of the passage of the 19th Amendment. And what I want to show you here is that women are voting by the millions on the eve of the passage of the 19th Amendment. This does not begin women's voting. These denim colored states are the only ones where women are not voting on any terms when the 19th, and that's only eight states. Um, and I'm sitting here in Pennsylvania here in Pittsburgh. Um, these salmon colored states, women voted on the same terms as men. That didn't mean all women voted. What it meant was there was no criteria male. So if you cleared the other criteria, you voted. And there were some women who didn't clear the other criteria. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, then these multicolored states uh, that were not denim colored had something that we often forget about called partial suffrage. And that meant that women could vote in certain types of elections, but not on the same terms as men, not in all elections. So the light blue, you could vote in presidential debates and the raspberry colored states, you could vote in school elections. And then I wanna just quickly turn our attention to the state of Illinois, just for a quick interlude, because it's an important one. In 1913, Illinois passes presidential and municipal women's suffrage. And living in Chicago is the great civil rights activist and anti-lynching crusader and journalist and all around just, just human extraordinaire, Ida B. Wells, um, who had been chased out of the South for exposing uh, lynching for what it actually was, um, a trumped up lie. And um, she decides in 1913, when, when women are enfranchised, that she will organize black women to leverage their electoral power. Um, she's already been leveraging political power in all kinds of ways, but use electoral power to start getting black men into office. And she organizes black women into the Alpha Suffrage Club in Chicago in 1913. And these black women begin using their voting power, which they have because there's no word white in the Illinois constitution. There can't be now because the 15th amendment said that's banned. Um, uh, and these women start voting in massive numbers and they start electing black people to office in Illinois all before 1920. So one of the things we also can't say, which I've heard a lot during the anniversary is that 1920 gave white women the right to vote, but not women of color. That's not what happened either, because again, it depends where you live. Um, it depended on the state where you lived. Um, that going sort of back to the big, you know, not the on the ground activists who really make a movement, but back to the big uh, story, those national, those two organizations, the National and the American merge into the very creatively named National American Woman Suffrage Association, which is a complete mouthful. So nobody says that, they just pronounce the acronym. They call this organization NASA. Um, and NASA unifies or is created in 1890. Uh, Susan B. Anthony heads it. Um, Lucy Stone dies shortly thereafter. They always hate each other all the way up until the end. Uh, and in 1900, um, uh, Susan B. Anthony hands over leadership of this organization to Carrie Chapman Catt. Stanton then dies in 1902, Anthony in 1906. And as I said, Lucy Stone had died in 1893. Um, and so none of those people will ever live to see uh, the ratification of the 19th Amendment. Carrie Chapman Catt um, has a very distinct political style. She wants to curry the favor of politicians and get um, politicians to like them and thereby you know, see that women are good and thereby give them the vote, kind of being won over by them. She does not think a federal amendment is winnable. Uh, and so she is back on a state by state by state campaign. Then enter, because social organizing is often messy and not the kind of harmonious way we remember it, and women are certainly not um, harmonious and angelic political actors. If you read my book, you'll see um, kind of astonishing things about the women in this movement. Um, Alice Paul enters the picture. And Alice Paul is a much younger woman with a very different political sensibility. She's trained in British militants, and she comes back to the United States, joins NASA, and says, 
I want to bring back a fight for a federal amendment, which at this point is pretty dead. Nobody's been activating for it. Uh, and she says, give me the chance also to do a kind of in your face activity. She gets permission to launch uh, the 1913 suffrage parade from inside Nassau. Uh, this is one of the first times uh, a massive public demonstration has overtaken the streets of Washington, DC. And she does this to announce a new campaign for the federal amendment. And this is the federal amendment here on the float. Um, thousands of women march from delegations from all around the country. They hold this on the eve of Woodrow Wilson's inauguration. And they do this specifically to kind of poke a finger in his eye and say, you oppose women's suffrage, we're gonna make you uncomfortable. And we are gonna upstage you on this moment of triumph where you come assume the seat of the presidency. And sure enough, when he shows up in DC that day before his inauguration, nobody's there because they're all out watching the suffrage parade. This crowd of tens of thousands up and down the streets of Pennsylvania, up and down Pennsylvania Avenue, um, grows restless and starts to attack these women for again being uh, you know, out of their sphere in the public. Um, so scores go to the hospital, um, the next morning when Woodrow Wilson's being inaugurated, Alice Paul has front page headlines around the country, and she is on to what she has now determined is a much more effective way of fighting for the vote, sort of making politicians uncomfortable and making waves, not currying their favor. Um, just to go back to the question of race and revisit Black women, at least in white organizing, which is what we're talking about here, um, Ida B. Wells will come to this parade, you know, this, the suffragist from Illinois who's already leveraging women's political power. And she, Mary Church Terrell, will be there, the head of the Black Women's Club. Uh, Black uh, uh, sorority chapter will be there. And they will all be asked to march in the back of the parade in order to please white supremacy. Um, and of course, they're incensed. Um, but this is the way in which Black women were often met in these kinds of organizations for women's voting that were run by white women. Ida B. Wells will refuse and she'll slip into the Illinois delegation. Um, some of you may have seen the movie Iron Jawed Angels. We can talk about that in the Q&A if you want. It's both dramatically compelling, but kind of factually inaccurate in a variety of ways. But um, so uh, Alice Paul then gets kicked out of Nassau because Carrie Chapman Cat can't stand her. Uh, Carrie Chapman Cat thinks she's going to reverse the course of suffrage by, you know, alienating male politicians that she's trying to um, she's trying to cultivate. So Alice Paul breaks and forms a different women's suffrage organization called the National Women's Party. So again, we have a split movement. Um, Alice Paul will then stage some of the dramatics that we think of leading up to the the culmination of this campaign. Um, she'll start picketing the White House, uh, where they stand with banners, um, often the National Party whip the flag, which you see here on these three colors, the color of the National Women's Party, with banners saying, how long must women wait for liberty? Then the United States enters World War I, and whereby Carrie Chapman Catt and Nassau decide to throw women's energies and efforts into the war, into supporting the national war effort, as a way of arguing that women are citizens and do essential work for the nation and therefore deserve the right to vote, Alice Paul says no. We're going to keep picketing the White House and we're going to keep saying this is unfair. We're not going to play nice. Then they start realizing they can leverage Woodrow Wilson's words against him because we have entered World War I to make the world safe for democracy. And Woodrow Wilson repeatedly gives speeches defending the United States you know, leadership and making the world safe for democracy. So they start reading Woodrow Wilson's words, crumbling them up and throwing them into um, fires, um, sort of saying, you hypocrite. Eventually he's had enough, he gets them arrested, but you're not allowed to arrest people who are not breaking a law. He's getting them arrested essentially for political speech, which is supposed to be unlawful in the United States. So he, he has to come up with some charge because they're not breaking a law. So he says they're obstructing traffic, um, they're on a sidewalk. But um, they go to jail, um, they refuse to pay the fines, they there start a hunger strike uh, over um, horrific conditions. They are force fed, um, they have tubes, forced down their throats and up their noses and down their throats. Many of them will have digestive troubles for the rest of their life. They then pour in liquid nutrient ingredients to keep these women uh, nourished. Um, and eventually word gets out that this kind of brutality is happening. And this is shocking to the white American public. Um, white, good upstanding white American women are not supposed to undergo this kind of brutality, certainly not at the hands of the state. That's part of the kind of agreement around racism in the United States is that women of color receive this kind of um, this kind of brutality on a regular basis and mostly the nation looks the other way but when this happens to white women it gets the nation's attention um, and 
as a result of women's war effort, as a result of pressuring uh, Woodrow Wilson and embarrassing him internationally, as a result of women's um, activism, and as a result of all the women already voting and showing that it's not gonna turn the world upside down. The amendment for a variety, for those reasons and others goes to Congress and passes in 1919. I want to point out that remember the West where women are voting, they've already sent a woman to Congress. They sent Jeanette Rankin to Congress in 1917. Um, so remember, masses of people on the ground are already affecting a change in American democracy and arguing that women should be part of the governance of this nation. Jeanette Rankin is there in Congress when this amendment clears uh, and she gets to vote for it. So there's a woman that votes for the 19th Amendment. Then it goes to the states for ratification, clears ratification really, really quickly, then stops and then stops and then stops. And it just lingers and lingers and lingers. And it looks like no other state will take it up and it may fail by one state until Tennessee takes it up. And Tennessee is known for its opposition to women's voting. It's a Southern state that does not prefer federal interference in its voting and in its state's rights. Um, the vote comes up in Tennessee. Uh, it looks like they don't have the votes to pass. Uh, it's going to fail. And then this young man, Harry T. Byrne, the members, the, the legislature's youngest member in his 20s, has in his breast pocket this letter from his mother. Um, and this is the actual letter. Um, that says, I have been looking for your position on suffrage and cannot find it in the newspapers. Be a good boy, literally she tells him in quotes, be a good boy and vote for ratification. Um, and he's sitting in the chamber and seeing that the vote's not gonna pass. And he decides that after the thousands of votes that millions of Americans have pressed for, he decides that he has to stand on the right side of history and he changes his vote. And with that, it clears by one think of the contingency of history here and how it just passes. Headlines erupt like the one we saw in the beginning, celebrations uh, erupt across the country, giving women of the entire nation vote this fall and guarantees all women the right to vote and uh, you know, blah, blah, blah. Let's go back to the amendment itself and just clarify what it did. It says you cannot abridge the right, the voting of citizens on account of sex. So all it does, and it's not insignificant, this is a, you know, that, this, that a social movement could leverage the constitution against the states is a massive achievement. And it's only been done one other time in US history, right? And that was the 15th amendment. Um, but what it does is not invest women with a right to vote. And I think one question we should ask is why didn't women write an amendment that gave people the right to vote? Um, that's a question we don't ask very often. Um, and I have some answers to that we can talk about after, but what they do is that strikes down the word male so millions of women are already voting in states that have already done that. Everywhere else across the country in those multicolored states and the denim states, women now do not have male in their way. This helps all women because it strikes down an impediment that all women face in some regards. But it's not sufficient to help all women because it leaves standing all the other voter qualifications that states have. And we need to go back now to that story of the 15th Amendment and look at why women of color in large measure cannot vote in many, many states across the country after this. Not all, some women of color are voting. But if we go back to that story of black men voting and black biracial democracy across the American South, that is very quickly overthrown by white supremacist governments and white supremacist violence. Um, and by the 1880s, all of those biracial democracies have been overthrown and white supremacist governments have been reinstalled. Um, in the 1870s, when those governments existed, the biracial ones, Congress and the US military had been there enforcing um, and protecting those governments. The US military eventually withdraws at the end of the 1870s, and really the North get gets tired of enforcing civil rights in the South and of protecting the rights of freed people. And by the 1880s, they've pretty much turned their back on that endeavor. Um, and freed people are trying to get Congress to pay attention, trying to get the federal government to come back down and protect them. And they really, the Congress really doesn't want to. The Republican Party starts to turn to questions of big business, really turns away from civil rights. And so by the 1890s, these white supremacist governments have realized Congress doesn't care. They can do whatever they want, as long as they give plausible deniability to violating the 15th Amendment. So starting in 1890 in Mississippi and then over 1890 up until about 1913, all the Southern states start to erect a new set of voting laws, these Jim Crow voting laws, poll taxes, literacy tests, all right? So that is being erected 
at exactly the same time, where'd my slide go, that this is happening, okay? So we often think of American democracy as a story of steady opening, right? And if we just look at this story, it looks like that. But as that's going on simultaneously, this is going on. Disenfranchisement is happening while enfranchisement is happening. And this is hugely important because those laws have just passed a few decades prior to the, um, the 19th Amendment. And this is, I think, another uh, sort of fourth reason why I think the 19th Amendment passes, and it's one we look at too infrequently, because those white legislators, legislators know that if they pass the amendment, most women of color will not be able to vote because they will be freed from a gender restriction, but ensnared in these racially driven restrictions, but none of which mention the word race, thereby officially comply with the 15th Amendment, at least in, by the letter, if not in the spirit. So many women of color still can't vote because they're ensnared in these new uh, obstacles that have just been erected in the states. And this is another reason why it really matters that the 15th and the 19th don't confer a right to vote. Because if they had, these laws would be illegal because they would be abridging a fundamental right that someone possessed. But none of the social activism, and we're, we're going to get to the sort of story of the 20th century in a minute, but none of the social activism around voting rights in the United States has ever won a right to vote. What they've always won is a negative conferral of voting, which is the elimination of a restriction at the states. But it has left in place the exact same structure that we've had at the founding that we still have now, whereby states can't do the things that social movements get the federal government leveraged against the states to stop, but st the states can then just erect new restrictions because they're still legally allowed to do that. They can't erect ones now around race and they can't erect any around sex. They can erect one around poll taxes. They can erect one around literacy. Those are all still legal. Black women are ensnared in these. They go to the flagship suffrage, white or suffrage organizations and say, um, you know, you must continue your fight. We still cannot vote. Let's collaborate. Let's, you know, let's make sure that all women can vote in the United States. And true to form, those white women suffrage organizations say, no, we don't care. Um, literally, they say, your, your fight is yours. We don't care about it. We've won our fight um, and our victory is here. Good luck. Um, I'm not even sure they say it that charitably. Um, so, you know, once again, Black women realize that these organizations are not um, fighting for their interests. And where they've been organizing on their own, they continue to organize on their own. And born of this really, again, is a continued Black women's suffrage fight. But Black women don't have the luxury of calling this a suffrage fight because they're not interested in one social change. They're interested in many. So we often don't see it because it doesn't call itself suffrage. It also doesn't call itself women's suffrage because Black women are now in league with Black men who are trying to get their voting rights restored. Um, and so Black women continue to organize around voting, but often again in their own organizations and often in league with Black men. So women like Septa McClark, Fannie Lou Hamer, Amelia Boynton, some of the really important civil rights activists and on the ground um, fighters for freedom who will always make voting a part of their vision of freedom uh, and they will continue to fight for it. And for many women of color um, and for black women in particular, the Voting Rights Act was the crowning achievement of their pursuit. Um, this was not just for black men and this wasn't just a male fight. There are women here in this picture, right? This was a women's fight as well. And the Voting Rights Act um, is really when many women of color finally access voting. Um, Despite its name, the Voting Rights Act, it does not also confer a right to vote. The, the difference with the Voting Rights Act, it really does exactly the same thing the 15th and 19th Amendment did, strikes down different state practices that are obstructing people from accessing voting. But um, uh, it doesn't use the Constitution. That's the one difference. It uses federal law. Um, so what the Voting Rights Act says is literacy tests, unlawful. Right, um, and really what the Voting Rights Act does and what social movements have achieved here and what African-Americans have achieved here is finally 100 years after the 15th Amendment, getting Congress to come back down South and say, you know what? You're violating the 15th Amendment. You may not do that anymore. The you being white supremacist down there. 
So in some ways, the Voting Rights Act is a crowning achievement when we look at it in short form, right? You know, Selma, Montgomery, Freedom Summer, maybe we go back a couple of years. But really, this is, a, this is kind of depressing when you think about it. it took 100 years for Congress to come back and enforce the 15th Amendment, which is essentially what the Voting Rights Act does. It says, you know what, that literacy test, that was kind of a sneaky way around the 15th Amendment. That was actually racially intended, even if it didn't say, you know, racially have racial words in it. Um, and was used almost exclusively against folks of color. It also says, you know what, these all white registrars that are intimidating and not letting voters register, you can't do that anymore. And it deputizes African Americans to start registering voters, sends federal people into the South to enforce voting, sends federal officials into the South to register people to vote. And then does one other really important thing. Um, it says to those states, you know what, you have a bad history of racially discriminatory, discriminating in voting. And from now on, you're not going to be allowed to erect your laws around voting um, without coming to us first, the federal government, and specifically the Department of Justice. Anytime you create a new voting law or a new voting requirement, you have to bring it to the Department of Justice and have us make sure that it is not racially discriminatory in its effect. And if it is, we get to strike it down. So it essentially allows the federal government oversight and kind of a veto power over the states for really the first time. Um, and uh, for decades, the Voting Rights Act will protect and stop the states from er erecting new racially discriminatory laws um, because of preclearance. It's called preclearance, this idea that you have to get your thing cleared first with the federal government before you can act it. Preclearance resulted in the striking down of thousands of racially discriminatory state uh, voting laws. Um, and in the wake of this, um, African American voting participation goes from, you know, single percentages to um, double, you know, 65 to 85% almost overnight. I want to point out, though, that the South was not the only place that used literacy tests and poll taxes. Ten to, you know, a dozen or so nations, excuse me, a dozen or so states uh, north and west did as well. So Latinas were often bombed up in um, in these uh, laws and the Voting Rights Act helped them as well. It also created bilingual ballots. Um, and, um, you know, we also had racially different citizenship laws in the United States. So many women were barred not because of poll taxes and literacy tests, but because they simply couldn't get access to citizenship. We passed, you know, the Chinese Exclusion Act in the 1880s, and that won't really get reversed until the 1940s and the 1950s. And even when those women get citizenship, they're then often ensnared in state laws, and then they get helped by the Voting Rights Act. And then lastly, I just want to point out that for Indigenous people, Pursuing voting rights was not always something that they chose to do because that meant colonization. And so the story of indigenous women and the relationship of them to voting inside our nation is a very fraught one because that meant losing tribal sovereignty and being subsumed and being um, assumed into a voting structure and a voting governance they wanted no part of. Um, so and Native American citizenship, you know, is a long and fraught um, contest of, of colonization and others, and that's not really over until the 1940s either. Um, so I just want to point out citizenship laws mattered. So um, here we are with this kind of triumphal ending. Um, but one of the things that I hope you'll see in this larger story is that what happens is social movements leverage the power of the federal government much against the federal government's will, right? It takes a lot of fight to get the federal government to come tell the states, hey, cut that out. You can't do that. But then what do the states do after a couple of decades? Start some new disenfranchisement practice. And then a social movement has to come along and strike down that practice, you know, leveraging the power of the social, of the federal government, which takes decades. And then the states just dream up and that's where we are now. Um, in 2013, the states and uh, a conservative movement has been um, fighting ever since its enactment in 65, uh, killing the Voting Rights Act, uh, which they finally achieved uh, in large manner in 2013 in Shelby County v. Holder. In Shelby County v. Holder, Chief Justice John Roberts wrote the majority opinion, and he said, essentially, preclearance is no more. The federal government should not have the power anymore to strike down um, state laws. Uh, because, uh, well, he, it's a complicated argument, but one of the things he says is discrimination is essentially a thing of the past. Um, and so there's no reason for the state, for the federal government to be striking down states anymore because they won't misbehave. What do you think the states do immediately in the wake of Shelby County v. Holder, the states that like to racially discriminate? They immediately erect racially discriminatory laws. 
In fact, Texas had on the books or had passed, I should say, they didn't have on the book, had passed a voter ID law. Um, and because it was under preclearance, they had to bring it to the federal government before they could enact it. And the federal government, the DOJ, determined that it was highly racially exclusionary. Um, it was very racially discriminatory. Um, and so they barred them from being able to put it into effect. Two hours after the Shelby County v. Holder decision, Texas put in place its racially discriminatory voting ID law. We are now in the United States since 2011, 2013, in the midst of the most massive wave of voter repression in the United States since before the passage of the Voting Rights Act. And that's because we're back in this exact same situation whereby never having been invested with a right to vote, whereby social movements, what they've accomplished is striking down a certain restriction in the states, the states just keep popping up new ones. And that's what's happening right now. And if we want to stop that process, I would argue one of the things that we need is a social movement for an affirmative right to vote that is shared by all members of our political community that states may not abridge. Right now, this map is now old. All states now have restrictive voting legislation introduced since 2011. I can tell you the story during the Q&A if you want of all kinds of women, native, white, Latina, plenty of women who are not voting now in 2020 the year that we ostensibly celebrate, the year that women won the right to vote. So 100 years later, this centennial moment, while we celebrate women you know, that guaranteed all women the right to the vote, tens of th millions of women are being thrown off the voter rolls. Women who voted 10 years ago cannot vote now. Tens of millions. It is estimated that over 20 million people in the last 10 years have been thrown off the voting rolls. And this happened well before Donald Trump was elected and well before the shenanigans at the post office. This now has moved kind of into the American eye because of the, the, um, uh, the um, uh, kerfuffle around the post office, but this has been going on at the state level for quite some time. We are now in the United States no longer recognized by uh, uh, nonpartisan agencies around the globe that measure the health of democracies around the globe. Um, we are no longer um, uh, uh, rated a healthy democracy because of the voting uh, suppression that we have going on. We are now uh, labeled a flawed democracy. We don't make it into the top 20 functioning democracies in the United States or in the world. Uh, and so what I want to point out to you is that this history is absolutely ongoing. It was made by millions and millions of people over two and a half centuries on the ground struggling to assert what they believe to be their God-given right or their sacred right or their civic duty or whatever it might, you know, however we think we are invested with this right. But we have not yet won that right. That white right remains elusive. And all of the social activism that has nonetheless cracked open that edifice and turned us into a democracy, really for the first time in the wake of the Voting Rights Act, ordinary citizens on the ground doing that work are the people that have made us a democracy. And they are the only people that can make us a democracy again. And this history is far from over. It has been handed to us now, and it is up to us to decide what to do with it next. Thank you. Fantastic uh, presentation, Lisa. Um, you uh, lots of questions in the Q and A, and and uh, we uh, have. Uh, at least uh, 30 minutes or so to uh, pick your brain a little bit, if you don't mind. And so- Yeah, of course. I look forward uh, to the discussion, yeah. Let me, let, let me start because there was, uh, there, there was something in, the, in your discussion that I was taught years ago in, um, I believe a Nebraska history class in the 80s. And, <laughs> uh, and uh, the, the professor was uh, really excited you know, he had a, the map that you did showing, uh, you know, women had the right to vote uh, in Western states uh, more so than around the country. Uh, okay, Maria and New York, uh, I get it. But um, yeah, 1917, but, New York. Yeah, yeah, that's right. But 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 his point was is that um, you know because so many um, so much of life then was on the farm, and women were such an integral part of farm work. Uh, that uh, it was more natural uh, for people to assume uh, that they should have some uh, political power. Are you buying or selling on that, uh, on that idea from the University of Nebraska in the 1980s? I am not going to bid on that idea. I'm going to pass on that. Um, yeah, I, I do not. I do not think that that is a useful explanation. Um, so, um, 
there are a bunch of explanations that float around out there about why the West gave women voting, or I shouldn't say why why social movements were effective in uh, in the West, you know, in a way that they weren't out East. Um, and I think it's a complicated story, um, but I don't think we know the answer yet. And I also don't think it's probably the same state by state. I think it pretty much varies. Um, Lisa, I'm, see, I'm hearing in chat that one of the reasons the West uh, was to attract women West. No, that's one of the arguments. I don't buy it, but that's one of that. the arguments. Yeah. yeah, that's certainly, that's the one that's often made for Wyoming. Um, you know, they want to get the, get the women out there to settle the rowdy men. Um, but yeah, I, uh, I, I find that a non-convincing argument and there's no evidence for it, but um, you know, it's, it's certainly one of the arguments that's made. Yeah. Right. That's I'd true. like to jump in at the uh, last part of your presentation was sort of startling to me that you're saying that millions of of women are, are, are and men too are because of of state laws are being disenfranchised. Yep. Uh, besides, we're the, in the midst of a massive wave of yeah, voter suppression. Yeah. Besides yeah. the and I I get the, the the argument for and against voting rights are not voting rights but IDs. But what else? What other sort of some might say clever. But certainly. Oh yeah, I should have mentioned those. I normally do. Yeah. I must have just sort of forgot, realizing that you know I needed to kind of wrap up. Um, so um, let me say that I have learned this from other scholars uh, and from watching the news. And once you notice it, you can't really miss it. But um, I would recommend um, both of these books. Um, this one's about the attempt to try to kill the Voting Rights Act, uh, sort of starting in '65 forward, about the passing of it and then the trying to kill it. And this one's about all the, um, all, exactly your question, Robert, all the sort of strategies that have come up since Shelby County v. Holder to, to suppress voting. And voting ID laws is one, and Carol Anderson has a great chapter on voting ID laws. And the thing about voting ID laws, much like a poll tax or a literacy test, um, particularly a literacy test, is that it's meant to sound plausible, um, while be actually kind of impossible, um, so that it doesn't really undergo scrutiny and people are willing to let it slide. Um, so many people would kind of say, like, how can a voting ID law be all that discriminatory? And they're absolutely right that voting ID laws per se are not inherently discriminatory. They can be constructed in ways that actually, you know, allow most reasonable types of IDs to suffice. And, you know, maybe it is a good idea for us to have people verify their identity when they vote, right? It's not that that's the problem. The problem is the way these laws are written is crazy. Um, they are written in a way to be as highly exclusionary, highly discriminatory, and then they're also accompanied with all kinds of efforts like in Wisconsin, most African Americans live in Milwaukee. They then systematically went through the Milwaukee Black neighborhoods and shut all the DMVs. Um, and, you know, I mean, so there are things like this that are happening. Uh, and so her chapter on voter ID laws shows us that the problem is not voter IDs. The problem is the ways in which these laws are being so deviously and manipulatively and just um, ruthlessly used. That's the problem. It's not voter ID law is not the problem. It's the way voter ID law is being. So that's one. OK, so that was kind of a long answer to like, we also have partisan gerrymandering, which is epic right now yeah. in the United States. Sure. Um, uh, and so in 2010, uh, every 10 years, states draw districts, right? Right. Um, and what in 2010, because Republican legislatures kind of swept uh, through state governance, they were the ones who were in charge of drawing districts. This process happens differently in all different states. The heterogeneity in our system is whack, mm -hmm. wacky. Um, and here's a kind of graphic of a gerrymandering, if you don't really get what gerrymandering is. So if you've got this kind of percentage of population, ideally, if this group votes blue and that group votes red, you'd get representation like this, right? Red would get two and blue would get three. That'd be fair representation, right? It'd be balanced representation to the numbers. But here's gerrymandering where we advantage blue. We draw the boundaries this way and this way, blue gets to just shut down red altogether, right? That's, that's partisan gerrymandering. Blue has now exercised you know, undue power and kind of disenfranchised red. Red has gotten to vote, but red can't make their vote count, right? There's no way you're, you're, you get to vote, but your vote literally doesn't count. Over here, red has very craftily figured out how to win a majority, even though they are a minority. So here, red votes with only 40% power, 
but ends up winning, you know, essentially like, you know, two, you know, uh, three, they win a majority. So when red wins three districts, they get this one, oops, they get this one, this one, and this one. Um, and so now red, so this is what we have all over the country right now. So in, um, in North Carolina, in Wisconsin, Democrats are winning around 60% of the vote and they're getting about 40% of the seats. Um, so partisan gerrymandering is another way that people are having their votes stolen from them because you vote, but your vote then doesn't count. Um, so partisan gerrymandering, um, the, um, the rise of mass incarceration in the United States and the ways in which um, the formerly incarcerated are often disenfranchised and the ways in which that is a racially discriminatory practice that has disenfranchised you know, tens of millions of people. Um, also um, the closing of polling locations uh, is an epic problem. And so this woman right here, Doreen Vargas lives in Dodge City, Kansas. Um, and Dodge City, Kansas is a town of about 14, uh, I, I forget how many people, 14,000 people, I think, or was it 14,000 voters? Right. I don't know. What's yeah. that? That's about right, yeah. Yeah, so about 14,000 people and uh, largely Latino, meatpacking. Yeah. Um, you're there in Kansas, um, largely Latino, meatpacking. Um, and uh, so most voters are Latino, uh, if they can vote. And um, uh, Dodge City, Kansas did what many cities are doing, particularly in neighborhoods of color, shutting polling locations, just shutting them down. And so Dodge City, Kansas, now normally in Kansas, and you know, chime in here, Tom, um, normally in Kansas, a polling location serves about 14 to 1800 people. Um, in Dodge City, Kansas, they have one polling location for 14,000 people, one. They've, they only have one polling location left in the town, okay? Now you got to get that many people through the polling location in one day, right? That's another way to disenfranchise people, just shut down their polling location or make it so distant from where they live that they're, it's, they're not able to get there. If you don't have a car and you have to take mass transit, you know, I mean, it can be really cumbersome to get somewhere to vote. So not only that, Dodge City, Kansas goes a step further. They normally have their polling location at the city civic arena in the center of town. Um, but they, and they send out, and that's where they usually vote. And they send out notices to the town telling people, you know, come cast your vote here. Without notifying anybody, they shut down that polling location before, you know, prior to the election. They just, they don't hold it there. And they move it to an empty hangar a mile outside of town without yep. telling anyone. So if you went to the Civic Senate Arena to vote, you couldn't even vote because it wasn't there. And it was outside of town. So Doreen Vargas and her husband decide this is voter suppression, right? And they start like going all to the meatpacking plants and passing out um, information and trying to create ride shares and things like that to get everyone to the empty hangar a mile outside of town to vote. And she says, this is voter suppression, right? This is trying to keep Latinos from, from doing their votes. Um, they said that the city civic arena was under uh, construction. And so that's why they had to do it. Again, I had, you know, I'm not trying to do anything wrong here. I had to. Um, and then, so an investigative team from another city came in and looked, and of course the civic city civic arena was not under construction. Um, so here's another, so closing of polling places. This is just one example. This is happening everywhere. So, so, it's estimated so, that over 10,000 polling locations have been closed in the last 10 years. Um, and um, there are many other um, purging of voting rolls. Here's another really great example, and I'll do this one quickly. Um, the purging of voting rolls is a huge problem. And this is whereby uh, Republicans and others argue, you know, these things are full of fraud. You know, they're full of dead people. They're full of people who moved. You know, this is corrupting our democracy. We have to clean these things up, which is preposterous because they're already cleaned up. But anyway, there might be some errors on them, but like fraud is nothing like people claim. Naomi White's a Native American woman. This is happening all, uh, all over to Native American reservations. She moves to uh, the Navajo Nation in Windrow Rock, Arizona. She's an attorney. She's going to be, she's voted already in Utah for years. She, uh, she's going to be gone on election day. So she calls the registrar to get an absentee ballot um, and is told that her voting registration was never processed. She can't vote. And she says, why? And they say, uh, because you had an obscure address. So we purged you off the voter roll. We never processed. She then does some investigation and finds that um, 528 other Navajos have also had their voting uh, registrations purged because they've had an obscure address. Now here's their obscure address, and this is happening to native people all around the country, um, particularly epically right now in North Dakota. 
Um, when you register to vote, you are by law required to put down your mailing address. If you live in a tribal nation, often the federal government will only deliver your mail to a post office box. They will not deliver to your house. So you have to put down your post office box. Then the county registrar will say, that's an obscure address, we're not gonna accept that. And so therefore we're gonna purge you from the voting rolls. And the courts are actually upholding this right now in North Dakota, whereby they're saying, yes, you have to put down your voting, your post office box. And yes, it's lawful to purge you from voting because you put down a post office box. All right, so these are just some of the ways this is happening. Like it's crazy what's happening. So I'm going well, on a great length. Lisa, this is Lisa, a topic I'm passionate great. about. That was great, Lisa. Go let ahead, Tommy. Me, let, let, let me uh, try to uh, frame this question in the way that I think lots of our teachers are thinking right now. First of all, they're surprised. Uh, I could imagine a lot of teachers are surprised about what you just uh, said. Yeah. Second, I wish we were all together so we could kind of like, yeah, talk with each other. But yes, please translate their voices to us so we can bring them into the conversation. Secondly, I suspect they're, they're also thinking, wait a second, you know, voting uh, should be among, even though it's not a right, as you said, at least not a right um, that's uh, presented positively in the United States Constitution, it's still this great example of federalism, right? It, it certainly is, um, at least in the negative, mentioned in the U.S. Constitution, as you it's mentioned. Not in, it's not in the negative mentioned in the U.S. Constitution. Well, in the 15th and 19th Amendment. Oh, so yeah, 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 yeah. Not yeah. Uh, abridge the, the right to vote. Yeah, yeah. So, so uh, and then in state constitutions, voting's there. In some uh, uh, na uh, federal legislation, uh, voting is protected. In, in, in states, I assume, I know in Kansas, there are state laws uh, with regard to uh, voting. So we have all of these sources of law that focus on voting, yet uh, we can't stop Dodge City from doing what they're doing or, uh, you know, North Dakota from doing what it's doing. It just doesn't make sense. Yeah, so, okay, so I'm also teaching a, um, so I know that, okay, what I'm about to say um, is something that even I still have a hard time wrapping my head around. So we have such unbelievable local governance over voting in the United States that it is really hard to get a handle on kind of, you know, fairly systematizing the whole process. Because a registrar, for example, has incredible power. And think of all the registrars all around the country, right, sitting in local county offices, you know, and they can just take the voting roll and just check people off. And this is what they're doing, right? How do you stop them from doing that if, if you don't have, I mean, your state law might say it. So, the unbelievable heterogeneity at the local level in our system is so debilitating. It, well, I should say it's such a point of vulnerability, right? It doesn't have to be debilitating, but it is a point of incredible vulnerability. And it's one that people who want to limit American democracy have very successfully exploited. It's very hard for social movements to respond to it because there's so many nodes of it, right? So it's like, how do you stop that registrar and this registrar and that registrar and the Right, and so it becomes very, very difficult to combat. Um, and I really do think, I mean, I have, it, the reason I was gonna say I'm still learning this is that I'm teaching a voting class this semester and the students just did their first project. And one of the projects they had to do was they were each assigned four states, there was nine groups, and they had to go, um, they had to go and look at the voting, the voting laws in, in their four states. And then they all kind of presented on a topic. And I was even blown away by the additional heterogeneity and craziness, like how votes are counted. Many states don't keep any paper record of votes. Even if they do electronic voting, they don't spit out a paper receipt. The person just writes down off the voting machine what it is and then carries it somewhere, right? They could write down whatever they wanted, right? You, do you see what I'm saying? So like the heterogeneity, at the, it's like, it is such a point of vulnerability and I'm not sure why we allow it. Um, so like you say, like why, why, you know, how do, I mean, there's, there's just so much local variability that does that, Lisa, does that if, we suggest created, if we created a right to vote, right, a federal right to vote that yeah. citizens are invested with or whatever sort of entity of our political community we wanted to use, then at least we'd have that to fight the states with, right? We'd have some, you know, don't, we'd have something to say back off of. Whereas right now we don't have any right that they're that we can tell them to back off of. Do you see what I'm saying? Well, we do to the extent that um, that uh, gerrymandering or any of the things that you mentioned 
um, uh, have a disparate impact on, uh, you know, highly suspect groups, right? Yeah. Uh, then, then, then we do, well, then we can use the equal protection. It surprises me though, that we've never just said voting is a fundamental right that is protected under the substantive use of the due process clause of the 14th amendment, you know, uh, the right to privacy is there. It's not in the constitution, but you know, it's kind of been the shadows of the amendments and why, how, how has it never come up that we could say, the court could say, you know, the right to vote isn't spelled out there, but over our history and tradition, we, we now recognize it as a fundamental uh, right. Uh so um, what's been astonishing, and I didn't talk about this in this talk, um, is, and I, I'm thinking about writing an article about this because it would be amazing, over and over and over again in US history, the Supreme Court has affirmed that a right to vote does not exist. So my, Virginia Minor, for example, um, in, 18, uh, in the 1870s, came before the United States Supreme Court. Um, when, so there was a strategy in the 70s, in the 1870s, among women's suffragists, just to say, you know what, we already have the right to vote because we're citizens. And under the 14th Amendment, you go into due process and equal protection and stuff. Citizens have a right to vote. We're citizens. We should be equally protected by the laws. We have a right to vote. And they, they go out and they vote. This is where Anthony votes in 1872, right, very famously. We only remember her, but hundreds of women go out and vote to test exactly this constitutional argument. Virginia Miners is the one that makes it up to the United States Supreme Court. She's a major Missouri suffragist. And in Miner v. Happersett in 1875, the court says, what are you talking about? That's a ridiculous notion. You have no right to vote. There is no right to vote. Voting is merely a privilege and the states can take it away for whatever reason they want. Jump forward to Bush v. Gore. Um, Bush v. Gore says explicitly, citizens have no right to vote. There is no such thing that has to be bound and protected. Like it just doesn't exist. So I agree with you, Tom, like that's kind of amazing to me is the degree to which this exists as an incredibly powerful idea in American history that has animated centuries of social activism, but does not actually exist and still is not actually recognized as something that has a legal there there. It's, it's astonishing. Um, so I, you know, one of the projects that I have to say, I just did this with first year college students in their first semester of college on Zoom, right? So it was pretty chaotic and it worked. So it could be a really fun topic for, um, for high school t history teachers is just take like, um, what do you have to do to register to vote? And by when do you have to do it? Like take that one question. And then every state has a secretary of state website. So the secretary of state in every state is responsible for voting law. So if you go to the state's website at the Secretary of State's office, there'll be a, a thing of all the state voting laws. So it's a really easy thing kids can access. Um, and then they can go through and kind of read. And then it's really interesting to take all the kids, like present all the states and you're like, yours does it that way, mine does it this way. What, like how, you, yeah. and the dates are all different, you know, registration dates are different. How you register is different. In some states you can just do it online. In other states you have to appear and like have a notary sign something. And like, you know, so it's like, why not just have when you're 18, you're automatically registered to vote? Like we could do that, but we don't. Why? Like and, that's another voter disenfranchisement and, practice we could argue. And I can't really think of, you know, uh, I work with a lot of federalism uh, people and, uh, but I really can't think of a, off the top of my head, a really good federalism argument for the right to vote in terms of states and localities having uh, so much power on such a fundamental thing, you know, like yeah. fundamental rights, uh, we nationalized uh, through incorporating the Bill of Rights, as you know, that, that whole story. It's not hard for me to consider that voting so important in our society that we would want to nationalize, um, unify uh, uh, voting uh, procedures. And I can't really think of a good reason. Bobby, can you uh, uh, think of a good reason why we would want the laboratories of democracy at the state? Yeah. Well, uh, you, you know, up until an hour ago, I did have good arguments. After listening to Lisa, <laughs> I, I'm not sure they fly anymore. That was my plan today, Bob. Ruin your yeah. night. I've done it. Uh, you, you know, I mean, I'm not, in, I'm not a, in favor of national stuff. I mean, I'd like states having power and yeah. using the term, you know, uh, 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 laboratories of democracy and all that. But I also understand human nature and how messed up it can be. And if you give people the power to do things and say, well, that's just how we do it in this state, who, who are you to tell me to change that?
as something as fundamental as Tommy and you're, you're suggesting is, is that the answer in your mind to say, guess so, what, you, you states you've messed up for 233 years, you've done some good, you've done some bad, but now we want a national standard for voting. Yeah, so, so I think there's a couple things going on. One is, um, and I'm not a constitutional scholar, and as I move into, I'm now working on this work, um, as I move into this, I need to sort of, you know, clarify some other constitutional legal um, apparatus for myself so that I understand this. So, you know, I may be speaking somewhat inaccurately, but to go to Tom's first point about federalism, what we don't really have here is federalism. And, and, and the reason I think that is because the constitution doesn't say the states have the right to do this, right? This is not a power that was given to the states. It's almost like something that nobody forgot, that nobody bothered to attend to. And so the but, states have been doing it, you know, because, well, because you know, the ninth and the 10th amendments, you know, the powers, whatever right. reside to the states, right? right. So, um, so, you know, in some ways it's more like the states just kind of accidentally fell into this. And so to your point, Bob, like I do feel like, um, we should invest every citizen with a right to vote. That would still not really federalize the way voting is run. Correct. Um, but what would it would do is give citizens the ability to tell states who have such a long history of just throwing up new restrictions, back off and stop it, right? right. And I think that would continue to happen. And one of the, one of the chats here, I was scanning through the chats, um, used exactly the phrase that I've been using in talks all year, which is that it becomes a game of whack-a-mole, right? Here's the state restrictions. Social movements come along, strike down these these three things. Three more pop up over here, right? The states are just like a game of whack a mole, um, and you know, as long as social movements are trying to play whack a mole, you know. And so, to me, we've done this for two hundred and some years now. Let's stop the game of whack a mole, right? Let's create a federal right to vote, which we all think we have anyway. So let's just create what we think we have, right? Because it's not really controversial. I mean, it is, but we'll talk more about that. Um, but that would not solve the problem because what would happen is states are still gonna close polling locations. They're still gonna gerrymander. They're still gonna do all these things, but it would give us, I think, a kind of better leverage to fight these fights. Because right now what social movements have had to do is go get the power of the federal government. And you know, getting the federal do, government to move is like- Do, you know, do we need to re- a Herculean task. Yeah, do we need to go back? I mean, this, the Voting Rights Act, as you said, worked for certain things. Then yeah. withholder, it says, look, it's time to stop restricting you. We've been restricting you for, for a Shelby long time. Shelby County, yep. yep. Shelby County, I mean, yeah. Uh, and But is it time to, one, revisit that uh, as a way to curb these kinds of behaviors? Yeah, so a lot of people think, um, so, um, okay, so um, we could go back to the Voting Rights Act. Oops, we could go back to the Voting Rights Act. That would be one you know, way of dealing with this. It would largely leave in place. And one of the things I should point out the Voting Rights Act does is only attend to things that are racially discriminatory. Uh -huh. And now yeah. you know, most voting discrimination is racially discriminatory. So at least it's you know, on point, but it wouldn't attend to all voter discrimination. Um, so that's one thing to remember, right? Um, so you well, can only use voting, voting if there was a voting rights act of 2020 or 2021. So some people that, say, you know, and Barack Obama said this in his eulogy for the great, um, you know, voting rights activist uh, John Lewis. He said, you know, we're in the midst of a, you know, I mean, watch the watch Barack Obama's um, eulogy. Uh, you know, the last 20 minutes of it or so uh, to uh, John Lewis. Um, you know, he basically spells out we're in the midst of a massive campaign of voter repression, and he says, let's have. He doesn't say let's have a. Or maybe he does say, let's have a federal voting rights amendment. I can't think, but he said, let's have a stronger voting rights act. You know, let's make a better voting rights act. Yeah. Let's register people. You know, I mean, there's a lot we could do. So the voting rights act is one option, but um, you know, that goes back to, if you don't like federal power, then voting rights act might not be the thing for you. You know, um, right, maybe, right. maybe for you, investing citizens with the right to vote and allowing a kind of, you know. So is system. this the best it gets? No, democracy can be run so much better than this. I mean, we have, there are so many good examples of how to run a democracy around the globe and we are failing epically um, and have for a long time. What's, what's interesting to me as a historian is we've spent far more time in this country disenfranchising people than we ever have enfranchising people. Well, it goes uh, yeah, back- Yeah, we call ourselves uh, the greatest democracy on earth, you know, so well, it's, a, it's an interesting- Yes, but you started off with, which I certainly teach as well as the founders and maybe I don't want to group them all together, but democracy was not what they had in mind to begin oh, with. Oh, no, uh -uh. no, they were afraid they, of democracy. Would they say, and I know these are silly questions, but if they came back today, would they go, we warned you, uh, you know, and here's the problem. 
uh, um, we in this century think that's, a, you know, we are a democratic republic, even though you gave us bad, bad grades with, well, with, with, the, with, the, with the research that you found. Um, is, that the, is that a problem? Is that some well, people say, we, you know, it's, it's, it's a republic is, means repressing the vote. Well, I think, uh, you know, if, if I might, Lisa, I, I would throw in that uh, you're exactly right, Bob. I mean, democracies can make mistakes. They do all the time. The people can make mistakes. Uh, right. They do yeah. all the time. They're elected to represent. That's why in a modern sense, uh, we qualify democracy with liberal democracy, not liberal like left and right, but liberal like in terms of guaranteeing uh, rights as well as uh, uh, you know free, fair, competitive for everybody. Yeah, yeah, for everybody, yeah, right. And um, and so yeah, I uh, it just it it shocks me, uh, Lisa. I mean, I, I I knew at some level. Yeah, I even heard the Dodge City story. I live in Kansas, you know. I yeah. I heard that story, and you think to yourself, yeah, that's just some crazy thing. They'll get it settled before the you know election day. It's made the KC Star and Wichita Eagle. It'll it'll all be uh, worked out. Uh -huh. uh, but but it, it floors me that um, that we can't uh, that we we have so many things to appeal to uh, to make voting fair and yet we're unable to do to that. Do I, guess, I, I guess you're right. Your primary thesis is right. There's just <laughs> too many. It's whack a mole, and there's just too many things going on. Yeah. Yeah. And there's so much variation, right? Even registering is so varied. Like, why not just create a national systemized registration thing so that I know that if just pending, you know, and we also have a nation of itinerant people, or at least we used to prior to COVID. Um, so, you know, people move all the time. Why shouldn't, why shouldn't I know how to register to vote when I get to Kansas if I've left right. Nebraska, you know? Right. Well, now I don't know how to register to vote anymore. Why should that be so mysterious? And how does What's I just I can't figure out what the reason for that is, right? I don't I don't see that it serves any positive purpose. Um, you know, I don't I don't see why Kansas can't have the same registration process as Nebraska, have the same registration process as, as you know Texas. And also, like, wouldn't this alleviate local governments from having to come up with these laws and stuff? Like, why why waste time coming <laughs> up with something? Why not just systematize the whole thing, right? And then figure out how to like improve your sewer treatment plant, right? Instead of like well, so, most. Um, most fundamental rights have been nationalized by now, right? I mean, um, we are one of the only constitutional democracies um, in the in the world that does not have affirmative right to vote in the constitution. So we're also very rare in that regard. Almost all constitutional democracies, there's I think there's around 130 worldwide, have a right to vote in their constitution for citizens or you know whatever political entity. We do not. Um, so, but state state constitutions do. Some state constitutions do, but it's not recognized federally. Um, yep. But at least so that's another know. that's another lever lever that citizens and states could appeal to, right? When they're being messed over. Yeah, um, it hasn't been done very successfully. Um, mm. It's not been something people have been able to leverage very successfully. But um, we're just about out of time, uh, yeah. Lisa. I want to. Well, one. Do you have any final final comments that you'd like to make before we? So I was just I'm uh, scrolling through the um, scrolling through the the um, discussion and there's so many resources I would love to offer. So maybe I'll just um, send some and then you guys can uh, yeah. can send um, them out to people. Yes, you are right, Mark. That it was the Democracy Index that I was referring to, the Economist um, Democracy Index. Um, uh, the woman started using whack a mole, which is awesome. Um, that that's, means I did my job well. I think that's Peg McGinn. Uh, the Brennan Center, the Brennan Center for Justice, Peg Man uh, Megnan uh, sent in. Uh, the Brennan Center for Justice has fantastic um, work on uh, mapping all this stuff and kind of apprising you of the ways in which democracy is being abridged. Uh, it's a it's a nonpartisan um, center named after a Supreme Court justice. Um, uh, I would also argue the, um, uh, yeah, there's a bunch of different people. And then, you know, somebody mentioned here, um, uh, Stacey Abrams, and of course, Stacey Abrams herself argues that she was, you know, um, uh, what's the word here? I'm losing my power of speech now. Um, you know, she got uh, voter suppressed out of winning that election. Um, and um, she now fights for trying to protect American democracy. But again, it's this whack-a-mole game. And I'm just not sure anymore after two centuries of whack-a-mole activism, that whack-a-mole activism is where we need to be still, um, so.
And with that, thank you so much, Dr. Tetro, uh, for your time tonight and uh, for a discussion that, like you noticed, lit up the chat. Um, yeah, <laughs> really good. Stuff but, in this chat. People are writing great stuff. So yeah, absolutely. Down the chat. So yeah. And I just need to uh, point out a few things before we go. Uh, first of all, you can see my screen here. Uh, if everyone, people were wondering, well, where do I find the video for this? Um, we're going to put it right here. So this is our power to the people. It, it's the the short URL is civiced.org slash power. And that'll, that'll bring you to the page with all of our um, Power to the People webinars. So we're going to embed the video right here uh, tomorrow as soon as we process it uh, so everybody can find that. And you can also find our, uh, all of our other videos uh, on this page as well, week one, two, and, and soon to come three. And, and I just want to... Did you put the... Um the yes. 15th and 19th amendment piece there that i wrote yes indeed okay. yes and so that that's right here in in your uh in your section um and if you click on that you're taken to the uh, ncss website where you can uh view the pdf right here uh great. so and Perfect. people can print it out or share it or do, or do whatever you need um so that's a great uh, that's a great feature as well um so i just want to ask everyone to join us next week, next Thursday, same time, uh, different link, but same time for uh, Brandon Hasbrook. He's an associate assistant professor at law, Washington and Lee Law School. And uh, we'll be talking about the power of symbols, monuments and flags. Uh, so uh, that's gonna be an interesting one as well. Um, I hope you can join us then. And I just wanna point out that all of our videos are right here on this YouTube playlist. Um, you know, you can get them from the web page, but you can also watch them on our uh, YouTube channel. And I will send out an email tomorrow uh, with all of these links, everything that we've talked about. And Lisa, um, if you do have anything else for us to share uh, that you'd like to share with uh, the rest of the audience. No, uh, just go quickly. out and, um, you know, um, I really so value teachers at the front line of history education. And um, I hope sometime maybe we have the chance to talk about how you might teach all the stuff we talked about today. Absolutely. So um, I wish we could have had that chat too. So, but glad we Absolutely. got together. And thank you yeah. so much to all three of you and to the center um, for the invitation. It was a great pleasure. You are quite welcome. And one final thing, I just want to thank our sponsors, the Center for Civic Education, Kansas State University, the Johnson County First Amendment Foundation and the Indiana Bar Foundation. Thank you so much sponsors. We couldn't do this without you. So we appreciate uh, your civic virtue.